Hi everybody, it's Layla here and I'm supposed to be on IG live right now. However, you're watching me on IGTV. Um, I'm supposed to be recording and being in conversation live for our weekly Live with Layla, um, Lessons on White Supremacy. However, the internet is not letting us be great today. And for some reason, I was experiencing some problems with Instagram Live. Um, it was very choppy. It kept pausing. It was cutting in and out. Um, and so I made the decision uh, not to do it live. I would have preferred live. I really wanted it to be an interactive, engaging conversation, um, but the internet won't let us do that today. And so I'm pre-recording this lesson and I'm going to upload it to IGTV where you can watch it there. I also must say, I noticed that um, my stories uh, were very quiet when it came to the lives. There weren't, well, there wasn't anyone else live. And so I'm, it's probably not just a problem that I'm experiencing, it's probably an issue other people are experiencing. And I also know that Zoom is having some issues today as well. So the internet is like, get off the internet and go live your life. Um, but we're still here because we're gonna do this live with Layla lesson today. So for those of you who are new to my page, who are new to my work, my name is Leila Saad. I am an, a writer, a speaker, a teacher, and a podcast host. I write about anti-racism, white supremacy, race, identity, um, social change, and personal leadership. I am the author of a book called Me and White Supremacy. You've probably seen the blue or the orange version. The blue was published in the United States and is available in the United States and in Canada. And the orange was published in the UK and is available in the UK, in Ireland, in um, uh, Australia and in New Zealand. They're same book, um, very minor differences, um, but the same book, just different covers. Um, this is a, uh, Me and White Supremacy is a conversation that I started in the summer of 2018 when I ran a free challenge under the hashtag Me and White Supremacy. And I walked people who have white privilege th through a 28 day process to examine their white privilege and to examine and understand and unpack and dismantle their complicity within white supremacy. That um, free challenge, which um, thousands of people took part in, I then turned into a free digital workbook, a PDF workbook that I published at the end of 2018 in the space of, excuse me, six months. That book was um, downloaded by almost 100,000 people. And it is now a traditionally published hardcover book, as well as an ebook and an audiobook, and it is also a New York Times bestseller, a USA Today bestseller, Wall Street Journal bestseller, and an Amazon bestseller too. Um, and so every Sunday, I hop on IG Live or Instagram Live to teach a, um, a lesson on white supremacy, picking from both my work through me and white supremacy and things that I'm seeing either on my page or out in the world um, where I think it's really important for us to examine deeper the ways that white supremacy is functioning and therefore how we can interrupt it and dismantle it. Dismantle it. Um, today, what I'm focused on is a lesson called why whiteness must be named. And the context of this conversation is actually a post that happened um, about five days ago on the page, uh, an account called The Conscious Kid. The Conscious Kid. I highly recommend following it, especially if you're a parent or you work with children. It's an incredible um, uh, page run by a husband and wife team and they provide amazing resources for um, anti-racism education and um, liter literacy and literature, especially as it relates to raising children, working with children. Um, and so if, if that's something that, you know, you're a parent or a teacher, an educator, you work with kids, or just somebody who really wants to understand, you know, um, uh, how we can have these conversations with young people and what we need to understand as adults, highly, highly recommend this page. I have gotten so much um, from the education that they put out there into the world. I've also interviewed um, one half, the husband of uh, the Conscious Kid, one half of the Conscious Kid on the Good Ancestor podcast, which is my, uh, which is my podcast. It's an incredible conversation, really, really recommend it. So the context of today's live is that about five days ago, the Conscious Kid posted a, um, a set of slides um, about white culture. And they were um, uh, uh, quoting or referencing the work of a scholar called Judith H. Katz. 
and it was very much it wasn't an opinion piece it wasn't a conversational piece it was slides that were directly quoting um, what this scholar Judith H. Katz um, had ha ways in which she'd broken down what white culture is she looked at things like um, family um, justice um, I have a couple of things written down um, holidays history um, time, work ethic, communication, justice. So ways in which these different areas are, um, how do they show up in white culture or how are they defined and understood in white culture? Now, I saw the post and as somebody who has been in this work since 2017, has been talking about anti-racism since 2017 online, on social media, um, something that I know is that whiteness hates to be named. The minute that you name whiteness, what white is, what what it means to be white, what um, white people do, you know, what white culture is, the minute you do that, two things are going to happen. One, somebody's going to report it. Usually, somebody who has white privilege, because if you're black, indigenous, person of color, you're not reporting it. It doesn't offend you. It doesn't upset you in any way. It upsets those who have white privilege because it's a direct mirror to their own um, unexamined um, complicity in white supremacy. And so something called white fragility gets triggered and there's a response of fight, flight or freeze. And um, it's usually the fight response which will cause somebody to go and report that post. And they are reporting it under the real belief that they have, the belief that they have that this post is racist. It is racist against white people and I must report it to Instagram to have it removed. So that's the first thing that will always happen. The second thing that will inevitably happen is Instagram will agree. And with, within less than a day, that post will be gone. And so I saw the post on the Conscious Kids page and I saw it and I knew that this was going to be happening. And I knew it even though the Conscious Kid has um, so many um, followers who have white privilege, so many followers who have white privilege who benefit from their educational work. I knew that there are many people on that page who are very liberal, very progressive, you know, want to be an ally, want to be in the work, but when they see whiteness named in that way, very directly, that that is going to do something inside of them. And the response is gonna be, this is a step too far. I need to report this. This is actually racist against white people. So they go and report it. And then Instagram will instantly move to have it removed because it will agree. Yes, you're right. This is racist against white people. Um, and so we, we see two things at play. We see the, um, uh, the way white supremacy plays out as a, at an individual level with the individual who goes and reports it and then we see it at the systemic or um, structural or institutional level where the system of the institution of these social media platforms will say yes we cannot have this we cannot have whiteness be named we must get rid of it and so within less than 24 hours that post was gone now that post had so many comments under it where people were, you know, learning so much from it, getting so much from it, and it was just gone. And um, and so when the Conscious Kid posted the next day that it was gone, you know, one of the things that I said was, I'm really sorry that this has happened. And I genuinely am sorry because I've had it happen to me. It is not a nice feeling. It is a horrible feeling. Um, for you to put something out into the world that's meant to educate you're not trying to incite violence you're not trying to incite harm you're just you're you're doing you're walking your path you're out there trying to do this work to educate people so that they can create change and then it's just removed without any consultation from you on what you meant um it's not a nice feeling um and so i said I i'm sorry that that uh, happened but sadly, I'm also not surprised because whiteness hates to be named. Um, the next day uh, or that day, I can't remember the, the timeline exactly, but soon after the Conscious Kid decided to repost the post. And this was after many, I saw many people in the comments saying, please repost it, please repost it. I got so much from this conversation, from that post. I learned so much. I'm going to repost it on my page, please. Um, we support you. Please repost it. They were tagging Instagram saying, Instagram, how can you do this? You know, this is not um, uh, 
against the community guidelines. This was educational to us. And there was a lot of outrage and a lot of upset. And so the Conscious Kid reposted the post. And again, it was gone and they reposted again and again it was removed. And so again, I want to say it's not Instagram finding it. It's somebody reporting it and then Instagram agreeing. Both go in tandem. Um, and I say this because I get kind of frustrated when I see um, people with white privilege railing against Instagram when Instagram wouldn't even know what was posted in the first place if their fellow white people, fellow people with white privilege hadn't in the first place um, reported it, right? And so, yes, we call out the systems, we call out systemic racism, but we also look at, you look at yourself. You look at yourself as a person who has white privilege and say, have I, how, how have I done this in the past? How have I censored, silenced, tone policed, um, gaslit um, black indigenous people of color when they attempted to just not even, they don't even need to be doing anti-racism work when they were just existing. How have I shown up in ways that have limited them, marginalized them, discriminated against them, um, made them feel like you cannot speak, you cannot be here, you cannot exist essentially. Um, really look at yourself. Um, so they, so the conscious kid did that. And then, um, then what happened? Oh, then in the comments of, of uh, that post where they were talking about the fact that they tried to repost, I saw somebody had written about a very offensive Instagram account name that has existed since 2012. Um, I posted about it two posts ago. You can go check it out there. I'm not going to repeat what the account name was, but the um, it, the name itself is 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 anti-black violence. Um, and many people have apparently tried to report this account over the years, and Instagram have said no, and they've never removed it. So I thought, let me let me let me do it and see what happens, right? Two days later, which is today, I get a response from Instagram saying, we've reviewed um, the account that you reported for hate speech. Um, we don't think that it is. Well, first of all, we don't, we can't really prioritize, we can only prioritize the things which we feel are doing the most harm. So we don't feel that this is. And secondly, we just don't see it as against our community guidelines. So. If it, we're gonna keep the account there, if it offends you, you can block them, mute them, unfollow them, but they're still gonna exist. So what this, uh, what this tells us is that it's okay for an account to exist which shouldn't, th this person who created this account should not have even been able to type in the letters that they typed into this account. Um, that's okay for that to exist. Anti-black violence, um, inciting violence against black bodies, that's okay, may offend you, but it's not offensive to us. However, to name white culture, to name what whiteness is, that is violent, right? That is offensive, it's harmful, it's inciting harm, and so we must remove it. And so I wanted to have a conversation today because this is something that this is the work that I do. I have a, a book, a process called Me and White Supremacy. My work is very much about talking about whiteness and white supremacy in very direct and honest and truthful ways. Um, I really truly believe we can't dismantle something that we don't understand. In fact, um, in the opening of my book, is it the opening or the closing? Yeah, so in the US book, you'll see this. You won't see it in the UK one. Um, it says you cannot, what is it? You cannot dismantle what you cannot see. You cannot challenge what you do, what you do not understand. The reasons why we have to name whiteness and white supremacy is that if we don't do it, then we don't know what we're actually, what are we actually dismantling if we don't actually know what it is. And this is why that post by the conscious kid was so important because we have to understand what whiteness is. So I wanna talk about three things today. I wanna to talk about what is whiteness. I wanna talk about why doesn't whiteness want to be named? And I want to talk about why must we name it anyway? Why must we name whiteness, okay? So when we talk about what is whiteness, um, I want to 
first of all direct you when you finish this to go and look at um, uh, the Conscious Kids page because some of the slides were actually reinstated, not all of them, and not the one that said white culture, that the uh, first slide that said white culture, that wasn't reinstated, but some of the others were reinstated. Um, and, and like I said, those slides were quoted by a scholar called Judith Katz. Um, go and search her work around what white culture is. What I want to talk about is what is what is whiteness? How how what is it? How do we understand it? When people are new to conversations around anti-racism, they have white privilege, they really struggle to understand what we're talking about. And they really feel like we're talking about we don't like white people, we hate white people, we hate white skin, um, that that it's some sort of racism against white people, that that's what this all is. Um, I know that there are many people that just believe I hate white people, that this is what this is about. Um, and what's so funny to me about that is that whiteness and white supremacy is literally built on the idea that black people and indigenous people and people of color are inferior to white people. And so if anybody hates anybody, it's the other way around, but that's an aside. Um, I, I'm going to quote from um, a website. You can go search this if you're if you if you're really interested to read more about this. So the website is the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center. It's um, aclrc.com and it's their page on understanding whiteness. So it's aclrc.com forward slash whiteness and they have um, uh, one of the sub sort of subheadings under there is called key features of whiteness. And I really like this. I wanted to quote from it. They, they themselves are citing a number of different writers and scholars, um, but they pull out some key bullet points that I think can really help us understand what whiteness is. So whiteness, they say, is uh, socially and politically constructed, and therefore it is it is a learned behavior. So in Me and White Supremacy, I talk about the fact that we are actually one race, the human race, right? This idea that the race doesn't exist, we are one race, the human race. Actually, yes, biologically, we are one race, the human race. There is no difference between me and a person who is white and a person who is Asian. Like we're Biologically, we are all one human race. However, Race is also a social, a social construct and whiteness defines what the social construction is. And so though race is not a, the idea of di different races is not a biological fact, it is a social fact. Because of how whiteness has been constructed and how race has been constructed in racism, um, there are certain meanings and definitions and ideas, assumptions, stereotypes, and uh, different therefore behaviors on how each race is treated um, about each race. Um, and so it's not biologically true, but it is socially true. It is politically true. It has been um, in the United States, it's been made legally true. And therefore it has an impact on everybody. Um, but it's not it's not real real. Therefore, it's a learned behavior. And if it's a learned behavior, it means that it can be unlearned. If it is a constructed thing, it means that it can be deconstructed or dismantled. Um, if you want to better understand kind of the history of what whiteness is, especially in the United States, but actually, I really recommend everyone listening to this. There's a podcast series called Seeing White by On Scene Radio. I think it's a 14 part series. And it is an incredible walk through the construction of whiteness um, uh, over, over history. Um, and I say, even if you're not um, from the United States, that you should listen to it because it will really make you think about how, we, how whiteness has um, evolved over time. And it should also pique your curiosity about how your whiteness in your country has been constructed over time? How has whiteness been understood over time? So it is, uh, like I said, socially and politically constructed. It does not refer, uh, it does not just refer to skin color, but it's an ideology based on beliefs, values, behaviors, habits, and attitudes, which result in the unequal 
distribution of power and privilege based on skin color. So racism is about power and it's about privilege. It's not just about the prejudice of, oh, I don't like people who look like that, or I have a preference for people who look like this. It's not just that. It's the ways, whiteness is, is a way in which power and privilege has been distributed that those who, who are white, who look white, have more power and more privilege over those who do not. And that's really, really important. It's not just about, oh, she doesn't like that skin color. No, it's about how has, how is, um, what are the power dynamics that exist? How much power and privilege do you have as a person who's white or has white privilege over somebody who isn't? Um, it, re re it represents a position of power where the power holder defines the categories, which means that the power holder decides who is white and who is not. The idea of whiteness has been, um, the definition of who is white has evolved over time. And that podcast that I um, spoke about, Seeing White, will help you understand how that has happened over time. Like who we see as white now wasn't who we saw as white a few centuries ago. That that is, it's been defined and then redefined and then redefined to what we see now in um, the 21st century is what whiteness means. The important thing to remember, however, is that right now, if you look, if you are white, you have a certain amount of privilege and power over people who do not. Um, but that, that power isn't real, right? White supremacy is constructed on the idea that people who are white are superior to people of other races, but that is a social construction. It's a lie. You don't, you are not actually superior. You are not actually worthy of more power and privilege. Um, but whiteness set it up so that you are, that that's the, that's the fact that we live, but it's not the fact fact. It's not the actual truth. Um, Whiteness is relational, meaning your whiteness depends on other people who are not white. Your, the, the whiteness holds a, a, a level of power and privilege, but you can't be in a position of power and privilege unless there are others over whom you have that power and privilege. So without black indigenous people of color, whiteness is, is, mean, is meaningless. It is about the relationship between you as a white person, a person who has white privilege, over and um, in relationship to uh, black indigenous people of color. Um, it says, uh, it, it, when it comes to relational, it says in defining others, whiteness defines itself. So you need blackness in order to have whiteness. You need people of color in order to understand whiteness. The only way that you are superior is because you have decided that other people are inferior. Um, it is fluid. Like I said, it changes. Who is considered white has changed over time. Um, and this is really important. It's a state of unconsciousness. Um, it's often invisible to, to white people. So for me, as a, as a black um, woman, I, I've always had to understand what, who white people are, what whiteness is, because growing up in dominant culture, living, you know, being in dominant culture has always meant as a black person, not holding white privilege, that I had to be able to navigate whiteness. I had to uh, be able to navigate a world in which I'm going to be treated as if I'm inferior, lesser than, of lesser value, um, uh, you know, basically inferior in all ways. I have had to understand whiteness for my own survival, um, for, just for me to live. White people, people who have white privilege, do not have to do that. And so white people often don't know that they are white or what being white means. White people are often very uncomfortable talking about their whiteness. And we're gonna talk about that in the next point. I just wanna run through this, but it's important that you understand that whiteness is often invisible to white people and that this perpetuates a lack of knowledge or understanding of difference, which is a root cause of oppression. So if you can't understand what your whiteness is, how can you understand what oppression means, right? But this is where we go back to the idea of what is racism, that there's a, such a thing as uh, reverse racism or this idea that you can be racist towards white people. If you don't understand the construction of whiteness and how it's really about power and privilege over black indigenous people of color, then you can't understand what the root of oppression is. 
Um, and then uh, lastly, it says, um, it shapes how white people view themselves and view others. And it places white people in a place of structural advantage where white cultural norms and practices go unnamed and unquestioned. So you are placed in structural advantage. So systemic, structurally, institutionally, you are not just seen as superior, but given advantages, privileges, as if you are superior. And that and that is at the expense of everybody else. You don't get it. You don't get more privileges and we just stay the same. No, it comes at the extent at the sorry, at the expense of black indigenous uh, people of color. So that's those are a key, few key features um, about whiteness that are important to understand. Um, if you have white privilege and you're really, you know, wanting to understand more, I'm going to really invite you to go do your own research on this. I was able to get that article just by a quick Google search, right? One of the things that people who have white privilege really need to be doing is taking responsibility for curating their education, for going out there. There are research papers, there are podcasts, there are books, there are videos. There are, there are so many things where you can learn about um, these topics, both in the modern day and through history and how the history has impacted what we have today. Go out there, go do your own research. Don't always wait for somebody to, to spoon feed you the information. Okay, so I said we, we're going to talk about what is whiteness. So we talked about whiteness and a few key features of it. So the second thing is why, why doesn't whiteness want to be named, right? So if, if whiteness was just about... Um, if whiteness wasn't about privilege and power over black indigenous people of color, if whiteness was just a thing that we were naming, like we were saying, this is blue and this is red, or that is round and that is a square, right? We would just be, de we would just be describing what is there. But what we're actually describing when we're describing whiteness is we're describing a social construct that is based on a foundation of um, uh, uh, the lie, the, the, the myth, the lie of racial superiority of white people over everybody else. And that that lie isn't just a little white lie, right? It's not just a, a lie that um, uh, has no impact. It's, a, it's, a, it's the lie that says that the way the world is, is correct. That it is correct that people who are white, who look white, deserve to be, um, uh, to experience their life in a certain way. And that those who are black and brown deserve to experience their life in, in another way. When we actually name whiteness, not as just, it's red, it's black, it's round, it's square. When we actually name it for how it is based on privilege, it's based on power, it's based on oppression, it's based on discrimination, it's based on the idea of racial superiority, it's based on subjugating other people, it's based on killing other people. When we name it for what it actually is, then people who are white, who have white privilege, are forced to reckon with the fact that they are a part of that, that they are complicit in that, that they benefit from that, that their ancestors have benefited from it, that their children will benefit from it, that it that racism is not just about, as um, Peggy McIntosh, the um, author of The Invisible Knapsack and the, the person who coined white privilege, it's not just about individual acts of meanness, but it's actually about a whole system that is designed to confer advantages to people who are white and, and to disadvantage people who are not, right? As when we name whiteness, you actually have to reckon with that it's not there, it's not those white people, it's not, it's not something that's separate to me, it's me, it's what I live, it's who I am, um, it's what my ancestors have lived, it's what my children and my descendants will live, it's what it, I'm up to my eyeballs in it, I don't know how to break out of it, um, and that everything in my life has been informed by it, right? That is a, a big realization to have to come to. And one of the ways that I, you know, there's different ways as somebody who's a black woman who does anti-racism work, I've had to find different ways in order for me to like continue, like stay, um, to not get so consumed with exhaustion and anger and grief in this work, 
one of the things that I've had to do is to put, is to try to, I can't do it, but to try to put myself in the shoes of somebody who is white, who may be coming into the realization of their whiteness. And the way that um, uh, I sometimes uh, can, like think about it in my mind is I think about when everybody thought that the world was flat and then theories were coming out about the world being round and you know it was if you believe that you were a heretic you were out of your mind how can it be round we can all see it's flat everything that we believe our entire society everything that we understand about how we live says the world the earth is is flat so for you to come and say the world is round i mean you're out of your mind like everyone knows it's not true right that's the way i think about how when people who are white who have white privilege are coming into this these conversations is that they are the flat earthers and we're telling them the world is round right we're telling they are no everybody gets treated the same racism is just something that bad people do um, for the most part, we don't have a racist world, we don't have a racist society, structural racism doesn't exist, systemic racism doesn't exist. Um, if it happens, it's a rare occasion or it's because of somebody in that system who is just individually racist, but we don't live in a racist world. We don't live in a white supremacist world. Um, the more that we name it, the more that they have to reckon with the fact that I have had like you know, my eyes like this, you know, um, co completely covered. I was not aware, did not know, nobody told me, um, could not see it. And the thing to remember is it's supposed to be that way. White supremacy is set up in a way that you're supposed to remain oblivious. That's the whole point. If you were to know, if collectively, everybody who was white understood that the privileges that they have, um, are based on and the way that they live and the way that society set up is based on the idea of their racial superiority white supremacy would not be able to be sustainable because for the most part this is what i believe anyway for the most part most people are not um villains in a in a in a movie right most people uh are wanting that their their conscious values never mind what they subconsciously are believed and what have been conditioned to believe consciously many many people um, want to live in a world where we're all treated the same want to live in a world where um, there isn't violence against black and brown bodies want to live in a world where um, discrimination and racism doesn't exist where they are not treated as if they are superior to people of other races that's the conscious part wants to believe that subconsciously something else is going on because of what they've been conditioned into and what they are used to but consciously most people this is again it's my belief um that if if all white people if all people who look white knew that the ease with which they move through the world in comparison to black and brown people the safety that they have in comparison to black and brown people the um the way in which they are seen as the norm or the standard in, in comparison to black and brown people comes from a basis, a foundation, an idea of racial superiority and that they live it every day and that they enforce it every day in um, often subconscious ways. Like if, if most people knew that, I think we would see um, the dismantling of white supremacy accelerating, right? But most people don't. You're supposed to remain oblivious of it. So taking us back to um, what happened with the Conscious Kids post, you know, that censoring of that post, that um, uh, reporting of it, and then the um, censoring of it by Instagram is very deliberate. It is, it is, it is not necessarily conscious, but it is definitely baked into what white supremacy says, which is that we can't name whiteness because if we name whiteness, then we have to admit to what whiteness is doing, has always done, what it is and how we're complicit in it. And then we would be forced to have to reckon with it and we would be forced to make some, some changes, some really, not small changes, some entire changes to how we live and how we relate to one another and who gets what and how people get treated. And we don't wanna do that. And so we need to shut it down. We need to censor posts like these. We need to limit the posts of anti-racist speakers and writers. We need to um, uh, really you know, find ways to um, 
uh, yeah, to limit the word getting out, basically, to minimize the word getting out. And that's why, I mean, for me personally, why I'm so grateful that a book like Me and White Supremacy is not only out in the world, but it is on these bestseller lists, because what it says is that these conversations are, um, are uh, uh, in, the, in the time that we're in right now, that people, that more and more people are willing to have this conversation in a more direct way. It doesn't mean that we then say, oh, okay, things are changing now, so we can we can um, take the, the foot off the pedal. We haven't even pushed the foot down on the pedal yet. Um, w these kind of works of all anti-racism, teachers, speakers, writers, need to be the mainstream everywhere. Um, but for the most part, white supremacy will try to limit it. And that's the white supremacy that's in individual people that says we can't name whiteness. I can't name whiteness. I can't face what it means to be white. And the system systems in this um, uh, context, we're talking about Instagram, but the systems could be schools um, uh, and the kind of, um, yeah, schools and colleges, universities. Um, it could be at work, you know, in nonprofits and corporations. Um, it could be in church or uh, worship spaces. It could be in event spaces. It could be it could be anywhere. Media, press, right? Anywhere and everywhere. Um, these institutions, these spaces, where people have not only the you not only have individuals who are enforcing racial superiority and and the power and privilege of whiteness, but you also have the systems that's baked into the system itself uh, and how it, that's enforced. Um, and so that that's why whiteness is so afraid to be named because if you were to name it, then you would have to deal with it. And I remember when I was um, having um, meetings with various different publishers for my books, for my book, one of the publishers, a very big uh, uh, traditional publisher, um, one of the editors that I spoke with, you know, questioned me on, you know, would you be open to changing the name of your book? And they wanted it to be something that would basically be more palatable, more easy for white people to be able to digest, um, a name that wouldn't create, wouldn't make them recoil or think that this didn't refer to them. And it was really important for me not to do that. It was really important for me to say, no, we name white supremacy. We're not going to say white supremacy is something that those people do over there. We're naming it for what it is, that it is baked into whiteness. It is baked into being white, experiencing the white, uh, the world as a white person and being experienced in the world as a white person. And that the only way, like I say in my book, to dismantle it is to understand it, to know it, to identify it, to name it. Um, because when we name it, that's when we then can begin to, to pull it apart. So the last thing is, um, so uh, as I was going into this, uh, why must uh, whiteness be named? So, so much of what, so much of what we see in the world as normal or the norm or standard behavior, standard ways of being is told to us through a white lens, through a white supremacist lens, through a lens of white racial superiority, from a lens of whiteness as the standard, as the norm. And this is why the Conscious Kids post is so important because it's naming to us what white culture is. Because white culture is, um, we are all told that white culture is the norm and it's also the cultural norms that we should all be striving towards. It's the the idea of a whole person is a white person, right? So I, I just give you an example. I've got my hair out today and my afro, right? I had, um, I had straightened my hair from when I was, I think, nine years old up until just a few years ago. My hair was chemically straightened straight, right? It's always been straight my whole life. Um, and it's only as I have evolved in my understanding of myself as a black person, an African woman, and also a somebody who is um, wanting to uh, like leech herself of the poison of white supremacy within her own life that I decided to shave all my straight hair, my straight relaxed hair off and grow it out the way that it grows out of my head. White culture says this is not the norm. White culture says this is less beautiful than straight European hair. That 
in order for me as a black woman to be truly beautiful would be for me to have straight hair. In order for me to be truly beautiful as a, as a, as a woman would be for me to have uh, as white skin as I can go, um, a body that fits into a white aesthetic. Um, that, that, is, that, is what, that is what we should be striving towards. And so I've used beauty here as just one of the cultural norms, but it can relate to anything, the way that you speak. You know, the way that I speak, I, I'm British, I grew up in, in the UK, the way that I speak English is seen as better because it's closer to what whiteness um, deems as correct communication. If I were to speak um, with an accent, or um, if you know English isn't my first language and I struggled for the words, that would be seen as of lesser value. So the closer we are to what white culture is, the more that we're seen as whole, the more privileges that we receive, the more um, we're seen as credible, as valuable, as just um, somebody who deserves to exist in the fullness of their of their humanity and their dignity. And the more that you deviate from from white cultural norms, the more that you are other, and the more um, marginalized you become, and the more um, or the less privileges that you hold, and the way that you are that you experience yourself in the world and the way that you are experienced by other people in the world is, is very different to the way somebody who is white is experienced. So you have to name whiteness because in order for us to understand what dismantling this idea and this um, social reality of white supremacy is, is that we have to understand what has uh, white racial superiority set up in the world as the norm, right? It, when you're if you hold white privilege but i would say this applies to everybody we see the world through a filter a lens a, a lens right the lens is whiteness the lens is strive towards whiteness the lens is everything that is right good correct um excellent um has to be judged through this white uh, lens when we remove the lens when we say I'm not going to subscribe to that anymore. I don't believe X, Y, Z way of showing up in the world is actually the superior way. I don't believe that being in this way makes me better. You are now beginning to make a break from whiteness. You are you are breaking from the idea that right, white racial superiority is correct and right. Um, I did a, uh, a Zoom call recently with Ebony Janice Moore, who's a hip hop woman is scholar um, and it was hosted by Sinikiwe uh, Delayo uh, De and um, it was about um, the um, uh, dynamics between uh, white women and women of color and one of the things that Ebony Janice said on that call and I still keep thinking about it she said that she never um, for, for her whole life she has never code switched if you don't know what code switching is you have white privilege please go and google what is code switching she has never code switched, she said, because from a very young age, when she saw um, black people code switching um, in the presence of white people, it, she said it was like um, nails on, on a chalkboard for her. It just didn't seem right. There seemed nothing right about it. But, and this is the part that really stru struck me. She said, I didn't see white people having to code switch for us. So I couldn't understand why we should have to code switch for them. Right. Code switching is a way in which um, black, brown people have been taught this is the way that you can exist in the world in white spaces when white people are around so that you can feel safe, so that, so that you can feel accepted, validated, so you can have permission to, to be there is to code switch. But white people, when they are in the presence of black and brown people, don't receive that same message because the lens is I am white, therefore I am the standard. I don't have to shift myself in any way. I don't need to change anything about myself. You have to shift to meet me, but I will never have to shift to meet you. That is what whiteness says. So I want to pull out a few things from um, me and white supremacy that are different different days that we look at in white supremacy that explain if we don't have an understanding of whiteness, um, how these different facets that I talk about in white supremacy can be used to um, 
enforce that racial superiority and this uh, and, and, and white supremacy, right? So um, on day one, we look at white privilege. So if you don't understand, if you don't name what whiteness is, then you don't understand that you have white privilege. You don't understand um, the ways in which you're able to move through the world differently, safer, with more comfort, with more uh, presumption of innocence, um, with uh, more support um, compared to black and brown people. Um, if the word white privilege is new to you, go and search Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, and she shares 50 different ways in which she has noticed that she holds white privilege. If you don't understand what whiteness is, you will not understand that, again, we'll, go, we'll just use the definition of the hair, that when you go into a salon and you have um, European hair, that you can go into most salons and people will be able to deal with your hair. Most salons cannot deal with my hair. And not only that, that I can't, I, if I, I mean, now I can do whatever I want, but in the past when I myself didn't value my own hair because I knew that the world doesn't value hair that looks like this, going into professional settings in the workplace, um, but there are many places in which hair like this is deemed as unprofessional, it's deemed as dirty, it's deemed as just not beautiful, and that the way to be professional is to have white hair. Um, day three is about tone policing, and I actually want to combine this with day five, which is um, about white superiority. And whiteness says that the correct way of talking, the correct way of communicating and expressing yourself is in a white way. What I mean by white way, I mean you should be respectable. I keep putting them in, in, in air quotes because it's not the reality, it's what whiteness says it is, right? So you should be respectable, you should be nice, um, you should be, um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't say things uh, directly. Um, and especially if you're black, you should really mute yourself. You should really be more diminutive. You should be, um, you know, don't, because any time that you express any kind of passion or strong feeling, it's interpreted not as strong feeling, it's interpreted as aggression, meanness, rudeness, anger. Um, it's, it's interpreted in a different way than if you are white. And so tone policing is something that happens from white people, people who have white privilege to black and brown people, because what it says is through the lens of whiteness, the way that you're showing up in the world is not the norm, it's not correct, it's not the standard. And so I'm going to ask you to shift the way you show up and that the only way I'll accept what you're saying, take you seriously, believe you, make you credible, is if you show up in a way that through my lens looks correct. And it's the same with the idea of um, white superiority, all the ways in which in, in which whiteness says, this is the correct way, this is the superior way, this is the more valuable way of showing up, that's the way to do it, is informed by the, the lens of whiteness. Um, on day six to 12 of, of me and white supremacy, we look at color blindness, anti-blackness and racist stereotypes. And all of those come from the lens of whiteness, the way black people are viewed right? We do three days on black people because the way black people are viewed is not the, is not the reality of what black people are. The way that black people are viewed are, um, say for myself as a, as, a, as a black woman, is there's a presumption that I'm not innocent. There's a presumption that I'm, ag I'm aggressive or I'm mean if I'm talking passionately or directly or honestly. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, an element of like, oh, oh, really? She's, uh, she's that, like she's in that position of leadership or she's in that position of authority because through the lens of whiteness, there's a limited number of black people who deserve to be of that stature in that place. Um, and everybody else must be an exception or they don't really, they're not really supposed to be there. Right. So the way that black people are seen through the lens of whiteness isn't how black people are. It's what white people say they are because of the lens of whiteness. And so when we see the horrors of black people being shot, murdered, killed, um, when we see in the workplace um, black people being um, racially aggressed, um, assaulted, hurt, harmed emotionally, um, 
this comes from this idea that black people are are worthless in through the eyes of whiteness except to the extent that they can move in ways in which whiteness will say this is acceptable you're acceptable now because you did this but to be honest with you you know there, that those number of ways like when we look at like um especially in the in the united states when you look at the reasons why people get will get arrested will get killed Ahmad Aubrey jogging in the neighborhood that was enough reason for him to get killed right so there are the the way that whiteness will try and explain why it's doing what it's doing to black bodies it has no basis in reality the the reality of it is just that black people are seen as racially inferior and then and so whatever treatment they get they, that's what they are that's what we are um, uh, worth. That's what we deserve, essentially. Um, and when you look at how um, indigenous people and people of color and, and black people in your country have been treated throughout history, like what is the history of this group of people in this country? How were they treated? What has been the racial hierarchy? What has been their history with whiteness? How has whiteness treated them informs their experience in the world today. And it also experiences, it also explains how you experience them and how you view them. And so without understanding whiteness, without naming the fact that as a person who is white, as a person who has white privilege, I've been conditioned to believe this, 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 this about myself. And I've been conditioned to believe this, 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 this about black indigenous people of color. That I am not seeing Black and Indigenous and people of color through a neutral lens. I am seeing them through a lens that says, I am superior, they are inferior. That is the lens. And then some others, we look at things like on day 16, white centering, who gets to be centered in the conversation, who, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a live on the fact that, um, I'd set up a, a space on my page for Black Indigenous people of color only to comment, but because I'd said white people don't comment here, I had decentered white people. Um, there were various ways in which uh, white people said no, we're we're not going to listen to that because they were not being centered, right? They were looking through the world through their white lens and saying, "How can you say that the people that we see is racially inferior?" should be centered here when we all know that the world is set up so that I am supposed to be the center, right? That's what, that's what whiteness says. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So there's many others. In fact, the whole of the uh, me and white supremacy is, you know, each day is showing you the ways in which you, um, unknowingly, unconsciously see yourself as um, superior and unknowingly, unconsciously treat all others as inferior. And that it's about you're, you're being shown something you didn't see and then being having you're having to reckon with that and examine it, explore it, um, recall the ways in which you've done it throughout your lifetime, through the ways in which you're doing it today. And therefore it gives you a chance to be able to say, I actually can change this behavior. Like I actually can, um, uh, because it's not real, because I'm not actually racially superior. It's something that I've learned. It's something that I've been conditioned into. It's something that I've inherited. I can actually choose to over time through repeated um, uh, sort of be behavior interruptions through be repeated thought interruptions, belief interruptions, actually change this learned behavior of white supremacy and do the work, therefore, of dismantling white supremacy within myself and then the work of dismantling it within my community, uh, communities and, and within s systems and societies. And so we we've looked at like why you know this 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 live this live with Layla has been about why does whiteness need to be named right we've looked at what is whiteness we looked at some of the key features of it how to understand it that it's not just about the color of your skin that is actually about power authority privilege um, and and the idea of um, superiority and inferiority and who gets to exist where and how. Um, we looked at why is whiteness so afraid to be named, right? And we've said, 
if we have to name it, if we have to actually look at it, then you actually have to reckon with it. And you actually have to change things in your life. And you actually have to accept that maybe I have had struggles in my life, but none of those struggles have been because I'm white. Maybe I've had this, this, and this, or these other identities in which I experience um, uh, marginalization and discrimination, but my whiteness isn't one of them. And my whiteness is still a space in which I can um, uh, exert power and privilege over others. Um, if we name it, then we have to dismantle it. And that's exactly what white supremacy doesn't want to do. It wants to keep the status quo. And that is why posts like The Conscious Kid, like mine, like many other anti-racism teachers and educators get reported by individuals and then censored and removed by these systems, these social media spaces, because we're doing the thing that you're not supposed to do. We're waking you up to the thing that you're not supposed to be aware of. And we're therefore um, helping to create a world in which people cannot um, stay asleep any longer. And doing that is very, very dangerous. It is very dangerous. Um, and that's why they get shut down. Um, and then we talked about, but why do you need to make sure that you keep naming it anyway? Um, because if you don't, then you won't be able to understand how you pick it apart, how you pull it apart. If you don't see the ways in which whiteness informs every single area of your life, that it informs everything that you look at, whether it's looking at and understanding what education is, what parenting is, what healthcare is, what who gets to live how, um, all of those things, everything. There is no space in which you can say, this area of my life is free of white supremacy. I don't have to look at it here. I don't have to look at it in, in my spirituality. I don't have to look at it in my hobbies. I don't have to look at it in my relationships. I don't, it's everywhere. You have to look at it in every area of your life. And most people don't want to do that, which is why they try to keep the blinders on. They don't want to have to look at whiteness, but until you look at it, until you name it, until you reckon it, reckon with it, everything stays the same. If you found this um, lesson uh, today helpful, please share it with other people who you think would find it helpful. Your next steps, your next assignments, like I said, go and search out the podcast series called Seeing White um, by Seen on Radio. Go get educated on what whiteness is, how it has evolved over time and what it has meant for Black Indigenous people of color. Um, Go and seek out different anti-racism classes and courses. Learn from as many different educators as you can. Pay them for their work, value their work. Um, and then lastly, because I have to, because this is the work that I contribute to the world, Me and White Supremacy is a 28 day process for looking at how whiteness plays out in your life personally, and therefore helping you to really name it in all the different areas of your life and therefore be able to, to begin to dismantle it. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on the next Live with Layla.